You're listening to Creep Geeks Podcast. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash cheap geek. So it begins again. Welcome back to the Creep Geeks Podcast. This is episode number 179. Forest Fen Treasure Found, New Mexico Bigfoot Sightings, Papa Legba, and Paranormal Helpline. Yeah. So it begins again. Welcome back to the Creep Geeks Podcast. Thank you very much for tuning in. If it's your very first time, welcome. Glad to see you. Glad to hear you. Whatever. Yeah. And if you're a repeat offender, welcome back. Yeah. So we have a lot of stuff to talk about. One of the things that we want to talk about is Forrest Fenn and his treasure. Something we've talked about in this podcast a couple couple times, a couple times, more than once, at least for sure. A lot. Yeah. And we have some other stuff to talk about too. But anyway, as it begins again, let's tell you a little bit about this podcast. I'm Greg. I'm Omi. And this podcast is about what? The Creep Geeks Podcast is an offbeat news podcast that takes a lighthearted approach to the paranormal, cryptid, strange, the silly, and trending tech topics circulating the web. Broadcasting paranormal news and fun stories from our underground bunker in the mountains of western North Carolina. Yeah, figure we kind of throw that in there with the way things have been going here recently. A lighthearted approach to things is probably uh, not a bad way to go. Yeah. Things have been a little little, uh, tumultuous to say the least. But anyway, well, hopefully you'll be able to enjoy this podcast and take it for what it is. It's a lighthearted approach to the stuff that we find to be interesting and fun on the internet. Yes. So, okay. So, if you listen to the podcast and you have something you'd like to contribute, we have a phone number for you. It's a toll-free number. doesn't cost you anything at all except for a little bit of your time. And that phone number is? 575-208-4025. Yes. You can leave us a, a message. Yeah. You know, a little story, if you will. If you have some paranormal experience you'd like to share, you can certainly do that. If you want to remain anonymous, you can do that too. Just say, hey. Yeah. My just, name is Anonymous. <laughs> just don't say, hey, call me back. Yeah. <laughs> because it really is difficult for us to give you a call back. So yeah. It's one of those numbers where you can just call, leave a message, and go about your business and get the pizza out of the oven before it burns, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So multitasking. You can also email us if you don't feel comfortable calling, and you can email us by emailing contact at creepgeeks.com. Yeah. You can also go to our website, creepgeeks.com. There's a contact form there. You click on the little word that says contact and leave your contact stuff. And I finally replied to everybody. Yeah. <laughs> it's banner day. <laughs> so anyway, as we move into the podcast, a couple things we like to talk about. But one of the things that we'd like to do is we'd like to go into a little bit of uh, interesting random fact toys to kind of get the old juices flowing, if you will. Mm-hmm. Sounds kind of gross when you say it like that, but you know. You said it. I know. As soon as I said it, I was like, I oh, probably shouldn't have said that. But hey, we're live. We roll through this podcast. When we get done, we edit, we upload it, and off we go. Yeah. So since coronavirus has been the trend for quite a while now, and it seems to be affecting everybody along with everything else that's going on, we figure we talk a little bit about some of the coronavirus search trends as they pertain to this particular week. Because every week is different, and we've noticed that you know most of the, uh, the search terms is ever-evolving. Yeah, but this it's, virus, we're so. still talking about coronavirus. <laughs> yeah, because just because we got uh, all hell breaking loose doesn't mean that coronavirus has gone away. Yeah. yeah, or that all the states are reopening slowly. Yeah, so yeah, and they're 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 wondering now they're 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 posing this as like I wonder if reopening the states is causing a spike in coronavirus. Well, though the county we live in shot up fifteen cases in one huh. day. Yeah. Shocking. Now, some people are saying, well, that's not true. It can't be the case because we just started reopening and it takes at least two weeks for, you know, results to get in. Well, guess what? It's only going to get worse. 
if phase two was what a couple weeks ago for North Carolina, yeah, then yeah, it makes sense. Thirty cases in like you know forty four days. Yeah, it's say. just going to get worse. Yeah. But one of the scary things that we seen was there's a <laughs> uptick in search trend for this particular search term up five thousand percent. How to find your blood type? I feel so called out right now. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what my blood type is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm a little uh, a little o positive. I think I'm O negative. You don't know. Yeah, I don't. That's the thing. Well, you know. Maybe I should click on this one. Yeah, maybe. The only reason why I remember is uh, it's on my dog tag. Oh. Yeah. Well, why why would this be a thing right now? I don't know. I just tell you what they are. I don't research them. <laughs> just saying. What? You probably got to know it for something. If you don't know it, then you know. Related topics. Mosquito. Ancestor. Birth. Topic birth certificate topic blood test hmm yeah interesting okay well uh one of the breakout searches is coronavirus treatment hmm. yeah, it's like okay and in the uk they're searching for masks on public transport up four thousand one hundred percent i guess because you have to wear them i guess so wow and then the up one thousand four hundred fifty percent is the hydrochloricolicoline stuff that's uh supposed to be able to treat coronavirus Hydroxychloroquine. I don't know how to say that. So um, that's been um, something because that study into the treatment of coronavirus has been retracted. Oh, don't know what that means exactly. And then rounding out in the low ball part of our list at five hundred fifty percent economic recovery for the U.S. <laughs> like nobody's caring about that right this second. It's like we all give up. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. So those were some uh, wonderful search terms for coronavirus. Kind of let you know where it's going. Mask is still kind of popular. Oh, wow. Finding your blood type is now popular. I don't know. The outbreak has caused economic chaos and uncertainty with Iowa unemployment weekly claim shooting up 1,300%. Uh, duh. <laughs> and then it breaks it's it down kinda, by, you know, by state. This thing has been going on for a couple months now and people don't have jobs and yeah. things that people were relying on for employment opportunities to create said income, like maybe going to paranormal events and things like that. And selling coffees and keychains. Yes. Um, you know, when that sort of dries up and goes away, so does the monies. Yeah. And I will say this, you know, they're talking about doing a second round of economic stimulus checks and there's these little headlines you see. It's like, oh, they're going to they're gonna do it. They're not going to do it. They're going to vote on it. They're not going to vote on it. They need to do it. Yeah. They need to quit messing around and get things going. We've got a lot of stuff going on. So anyway, there's your happy coronavirus search trend topic. But we decided to add a little bit in here um, with our last podcast. We did that where we actually added a little bit of a uh, a new kind of interesting random factoid section called interesting random FDA recalls. <laughs> yes, because, hey, the last one we talked about was that, you know, hey, the FDA is recalling metformin hydrochloride extended release tablets. Oh, now, if you don't have diabetes, you probably don't know what this is. And this is used in the treatment of diabetes. <laughs> Or diabetes, diabetes. Or diabetes. Diabeto. Yeah. And what it is, is that little pill you take. It's a big fat pill. It's a chalky pill. It's an extended release tablet where it's supposed to help with the blood sugar and all that stuff. Yeah. Well, they've been recalling these pills that have been made by multiple manufacturers because they have a detection of the NDMA, whatever it is. It's not good. That's N, N-, N- as in Nancy. Yeah, Nancy, Nancy Delta Michael Alpha. Yeah. Yeah. And evidently, it's not good. And when we last talked about this, there was only one company, Apotex or Apotech Corp. Corps. How do you say that? Apotex Corporation. Yeah. Was the only one. Now there's another one, Activis or Activis. It's A C T A V I S. Mm-hmm. And another one, Time Cap Labs Incorporated. And Amnil. Yes. And uh, Amnil. So now we're looking at four companies that have been making this product and they all have the same thing in them. Bad stuff. Yeah. So, I don't know what to tell you other than, hey, if you take this pill, you might want to give your doctor a call and say, hey, look, man, they're recalling this stuff. What can we do about it? And I'm in that list as well. Mm-hmm. Now, in some other news related to FDA recalls, some breast implants have been recalled. So, it can, can <laughs> it contain uh, allergen uh, aesthetics. So, it has some kind of increased risk of... Uh, Whatever this is. I don't know what it is. Some kind of reaction. We're just full of bad news today, aren't we? Yeah, and we don't know what we're talking about, so that makes it even worse. People are like, oh my God. They're talking about stuff we don't even know. We don't know either. So, 
And champion meat goat pellets medicated feed is also being recalled due to the elevated level of renusamine, which is some kind of something that's probably not good. Poor goats. Yeah. And uh, we also talked about crab cakes being recalled. Well, they're still there. So anyway, the big thing is the metformin stuff. So if you take metformin, you might want to give somebody a call. Yeah. So definitely what, somebody with medical training and a medical yeah, don't background. call us and leave a message on you know, <laughs> our little 1-800 number and saying, Hey, look, we, you know, yeah. Don't leave a message at five, seven, five, two, zero, eight, four, zero, two, five. Yeah. Yeah. And say, Hey, what am I going to do? I'm going to say, Hey, look, I don't know. When you find out, call me back and tell me what to do. <laughs> so, I mean, I guess what they got to do is recall all this stuff and get new batches out. I have no idea though. So, Anyway, let's talk about what's in the news. Locally in the news, there's just this uh, this title or this uh, anyway, Forrest Finn, right? His treasure has been found. I'm so upset. Yeah, and we've talked about this three or four, maybe even five times on the podcast, where people have gone out and searched and unfortunately died due to exposure and things like that from I, the from the search, and they've been and I even tried to rescued t- tied into the missing four one one phenomenon because this stuff was a allegedly located this treasure was allegedly located in a hot spot of missing persons yeah so that that was my part of my curiosity about it Mm. yeah but allegedly it's been found yes now here's the deal we say allegedly because there's some weirdness going on with this sort of thing it has been found before it's you know it's controversial it's it's basically been a decade-long chase and the reason why it kind of came into our radar was it's this guy's a New Mexico millionaire, right? And he set it out there, and he had a poem, and people would read the poem, decipher it, and try to find it somewhere in the Rocky Mountains, right? Yeah. And people have gotten, you know, basically had to be rescued, got lost out there. People have died from this sort of thing, this treasure quest, if you will. And, you know, it, so it's been a thing, and it looked like it was going to be one of these sort of treasures that is going to be around for a hundred years, right? Cause nobody was getting anywhere close to it. Yeah. But all of a sudden, right. Forrest Finn, who is the New Mexico millionaire who created this whole thing and put the millions of dollars of, of treasure out there to be found has came out and said that he can confirm that it's been found. <clears throat> <Okay. clears throat> yeah. So, and according to today, Right, website today.com. Mm-hmm. He says, I can confirm it's been found. It was found by a man from back east, but he's shy. He doesn't want his name released. Okay. So the treasurer is supposed to have like a windfall value of like over $2 million, gold coins, diamonds, emeralds, other gems, you know, so like for, you know, full on, like for real treasure. Right. Oh, this gets even dirtier. Yeah. So Finn had confirmed that the man had indeed found the treasure by asking him to send a photo of the chest. Right. Yeah. And Finn has declined to share where it was located. And he says, I don't want to share too much information right now. And the news of the discovery is first reported by thrill of the chase of blog devoted to the treasure hunt. So, hmm. yeah. So according to the post, apparently penned by Finn himself, the chest was under a canopy of stars in the lush forested vegetation of the Rocky mountains and had not moved from the spot where I hid it more than 10 years ago. Okay. I do not know the person who found it. I congratulate thousands of people who participated in the search and hope they will continue to be drawn by the promise of other discoveries. The post continued, right? Yeah. So the search is over. Look for more information and photo uh, photos in the coming days. Oh. And it has a picture of him from 2014 standing there in his little library. So I went to the Santa Fe, New Mexican, because yeah. they've been on this ever since... They saw some people acting pretty crazy trying to find this. Um, They went, and on Sunday when they were trying to interview him, they kind of pushed for the photograph. They kind of pushed for some proof. And Fenn just kept declining all of their responses and their requests. Yeah. Now, at the same time, Barbara Anderson, who is a Chicago real estate attorney, said she's filing an injunction in federal district court alleging she solved the puzzle recently but was hacked by someone she doesn't know he stole my solve he followed and cheated me to get the chest so she's filing this injunction this week 
Well, yeah. If this is one of those things where it's finders keepers, <sighs> that's like if you know she can prove that this person stole it, she may be entitled to some of it, but more than likely, it's not going to happen. This is like if you spot off some random numbers and I go play them in the lottery, right? Yeah. And I win the lottery, and you go, "Oh, hey, I gave you those numbers," and I go prove it, and you can't, then you're definitely not going to get any kind of thing out of it. But you know, there may be a possibility of her making some kind of money off of this you know if she can prove it somehow some way but i don't i okay when my spider sense goes off there's something wrong and there's something totally wrong with this this might be part of your spider sense brian erskine of prescott arizona just filed a suit against forrest fenn and the suit alleges that um the site in question is the san juan mountains between colorado and silverton and Oray. And is accessible by U.S. 550 Highway. <clears throat> known okay, as, so in the New Mexico. Yeah. So Erskine says, Odd, Fenn just got served with my lawsuit, and now we have this press release alleging it's been found. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Forrest Fenn has been kind of in trouble before because two thrill seekers died in their search for the loot, right? Yeah. New Mexico State Police in 2017 called him to end the game. After our pastor was also found dead. Yeah. We've had people that have been charged with multiple, you know, charges and crimes for trying to find this treasure for destruction of property and trespassing and everything else. And it looked like it was just getting to the point where maybe some heat got to him. And now all of a sudden it's been found. Exactly. And, you know, the vibe I get from this is, oh, and so, and he really hasn't had much remorse to the whole thing. Right. And, and I kind of agree with him and to a certain extent. You know, if it's a treasure quest and you go out there and you get killed in the pro in, in the basically in the process of trying to find the treasure, is the person who hid the treasure at fault, or are you at fault? Yeah. Because I mean, if you've watched things like the Curse of Oak Island and stuff like that, I mean, you know, if it happens, it happens. But um, when he had some pressure to call off the hunt, Finn told the New York Times at that particular time, "If someone drowns in the swimming pool, we shouldn't drain the pool." We should teach people how to swim. But. I agree with him. Yeah. Now, teaching people how to swim, that's one thing. And a lot of people took that in the context that he would slowly start releasing better clues. And he didn't. I, no, I don't think that's what that means at all. See, I think it's just like saying, hey, if you're going to go out there and you're going to, you know, embark upon this quest and embrace the risk, then you should embrace the risk and you should be better prepared. You should do this sort of thing. Mm. In other words, it's on you. Okay. If I jump in a swimming pool and I don't know how to swim, whose fault is that? If I drown, is it the pool's fart, fault? Fault? Fart. <laughs> is it the pool's fault for being a fart? Is it the pool's fault for being a fault, or is it my fault for jumping in and not knowing how to swim? But see, we live in such a litigious society, right? That and see, what he's saying the, is the pool owner these days. This crusty art dealer, yeah, Finn is saying, if you ain't tough enough, that's on you. Hmm. he's old school man he, this guy reminds me of like storm on the beaches of normandy kind of stuff where it's just like you know your grandpa is like well you know if you don't know how to do it you don't know how to do it. it's up to, it's no words it's up to you to grab the intestinal fortitude to make it happen and we don't do that these days okay. you know so i mean i know and see and if i went out there to find his treasure right yeah and this is one of these things where it's like you do it at your own risk and I break my leg. I'm not suing him because I went out there on a quest and I broke my leg. Right? I mean, you know what I mean? It's just, that's how I look at it. I mean, a lot of people don't look at it. They're like, you should be responsible because I went out there and did something on my own and, and hurt myself or killed myself to death. You know, now I can see if you go out there and you take this quest and you go out and you have to get rescued, you know, and you're putting other people's lives at risk. And then you go out and you do it again and someone else dies you should be charged with a crime. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> now you're placing the rescuers at risk and someone has passed away. And so the negligence could be sort of pointed one way or the other with the whole thing. You know, because some of these people died because they just like, well, let me grab this bottle of water and go on out there and do this adventure in the middle of nowhere. And they're shocked. And, you know, when they get out there, they get in trouble. It's like the desert, man. It's the mountains, it's the Rocky Mountains, it's the desert. You don't go off not being prepared. And when you go off and you're not prepared and you suffer the consequences, get hurt or killed to death, that's kind of on you. Well, the the one um, treasure hunter seeker guy that's filing a lawsuit, his biggest complaint was, 
some of the clues were either so vague or they felt so much of a certain way that they were misleading. They were in, so intentionally misleading. So so what? That's part of it. If you made it so easy, then it would have been found already. So what? This guy's suing it because it's like it's hard? Okay, so I go back to in the late 80s, there was a treasure hunt called The Masquerade. And it was based off of a children's book. And the book had all these clues in it that to the point an 8 to 12 year old child should be able to figure out the puzzle. Now over the span of I want to say a few years many like 10 to 12 year olds got very close to deciphering all the clues in this thing. However the guy was deceived because he did have some very hard clues in those and those um, this guy kind of fooled him and posed as a 10 year old kid in some letters and correspondence and said, um, I think I'm close. Could you help me out? And because he kept writing, he kind of just said, you know, you're close. So he gave away the last clue, which nobody would have ever guessed. And the treasure was pretty much swept away from these little kids. It was meant as an ent- entertainment for these little kids. So the clues were easy enough up to a point. Yeah, but that has nothing to do I, with this. I, I mean, I understand what you're saying is that, you know, the person was deliberately deceived on both parts, you yeah. know, on the part of the person who created the puzzle and the, and the puzzler, or what do you call the puzzle, puzzle doer? The solver. Solver. This is different. This, there is no guarantees with this stuff. It's a treasure he put out there. He's, you know, he's basically said, I'm not going to be responsible for any of it. And he's kept out of it. But, some of the clues that he's put in here, there's hundreds of people who are like, this has to be the solution for certain Yeah, clues. but it, it's obviously not. So if they're wrong, they're wrong. This is how treasure hunting goes. You have clues. If you decipher them incorrectly, that just means you're wrong. And you have to keep doing it. It's not easy. What's he supposed to say? Well, you're close. You're getting warmer. You're getting warmer. No, man. This is all on you. See, the only problem that Forrest Finn has with this entire thing is I think that he thought he would be dead by the time this was found. And he wouldn't have to worry about this stuff. (laughs) Seriously, because he's an older gentleman. Now he's having multiple lawsuits filed against him. And I hope that when this goes to court, if it does go to court, the judge goes, stop crying. Too bad. You guys tried to solve it. You didn't solve it. Too freaking bad. You know what I mean? Because honestly, Blackbeard, when he put his treasure out, he didn't do I mean, they leave you a little bit of clues. But at the end of the day, it's not their job to solve it. I think people just need to stop whining. Because if I was a judge, I'd be like, so wait a minute. You guessed and you were wrong. But see, then, And it deliberately deceived you. Huh. But, okay, so like I'm trying to load this page right now where it's like, you know, at one point somebody figured out something and they were like, oh, so the clue is 44 pounds. And then Fenn confirmed, yeah, that's right. It's 44 pounds. And then like in a different statement he's like no 42 pounds is the clue so even he has like okay well so what maybe that has nothing to do with it or 8.25 miles north of santa fe is supposed to be a clue did he ever did he ever put this out as being a contest you ever wondered like when you sign or you join like these little contests that that thing that that you see where they have little rules and shit at the end of them yeah it's so people don't get sued because this is how they do. And I personally think, too bad. Find it, yay. You win. You solve the puzzle. If you don't find it, or if you're shocked that you went the wrong way with it and you got it wrong, too bad. You know, and he's not giving out participation trophies or anything like that. And, you know, people have taken his information the wrong way and gotten hurt over. But at the end of the day, but I he's mean, also on, given man. out wrong information. OK, so you, have you ever played a video game where the information you got from the wise old sage was wrong? And you had to take a different tack with it and you had to be clever enough to figure it out. But that's a video game. You can hit resume it's a or get- start over. You know what? You c- no, no. Nope. Yeah. Disagree. Disagree. 
just said a video game. And video okay, games. you just said a game where kids were deceived. I mean, when I say a video game, I'm just saying that the, but see, that's the, the precedent thing. has been set in the past. And these games of chance and in and, and the hunt for fortune that you may be turned the wrong direction to get the wrong information. So this is not an unusual thing. It's not out. It's not out there like, oh, my God, this is the first time. It's ever. No, this should be commonplace for all these people. Even me being an older gentleman who's played video games and board games in the past. You know, including a very brief soiree into the Dungeons and Dragons world <laughs> until I found a girlfriend got done with that. Have seen where I have been basically um, steered the wrong direction or given bunk information in my quest. But those are games. I didn't sue them. This is a game, too. I mean, if you want to put it into gamification and all that stuff, it falls right in that category. But it's not. These are. This is. And you're also talking to someone who joined the military where the military recruiter wasn't exactly the most 100% truthful person in the world. A little bit of a car salesman going on. <laughs> Because that's kind of what they do. They paint you this grandiose picture, and it's maybe not 100% the way you envisioned it when you get in the military. And see, that's, that that right there is part But of- I had a realistic view saying, okay, it's not going to be exactly, you know, all puppy dogs and, and flowers and cupcakes and stuff when I join the military. Hell, I might even die in my quest to serve my country. But see, that is part of the argument right there. People have this idealistic image of what a treasure hunt is. And they're still comparing this whole game thing and treating it like it's a game. He's treating it like it's a game with these like very vague clues and stuff when in fact people are dying. People need to get rescued. That's It's it, dangerous. It, okay, but at the same time, if you're going to play a game like that and a person who created a game is still alive, don't you think you need to research the person who's actually doing it? And, and to go further into that point, like we're going to talk later about Bigfoot in New Mexico. Everyone's ideal, especially out here where we live it's now. It's not an ideal. It's an idea of. Idea of or concept of New Mexico, especially out here with the people we talk to who have no understanding of like New Mexico terrain and environment or Southwest in general. I mean, these people go out, they feel that they're prepared and they might be, you know, okay. rose colored glasses. Look, 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 look. Hold on. Mm-hmm. So is the fault that they're not prepared correctly, New Mexico's fault? Or is it their fault? I wouldn't say it's New Mexico's fault. It's their fault. Let me give an example. I would say it's Forest Fen and the people's fault. Going back to what you said about not being prepared for the environment you're in, we broke down in New Mexico Mm -hmm. on the side of the road with an irreplaceable park in our great white buffalo. Right? Mm Mm-hmm. And what happened? We survived. Why did we survive? Because we were prepared and smart. And why were we prepared and smart? Because we're just smart. And? We have that sense of ingenuity. And? Not sure. Your husband, me, researches the hell out of things like this. And when we broke down in the desert, we had 40 gallons of water. Mm Mm-hmm. We had food, we had shelter, we had clothes, we had medical stuff, we had a toolkit, we had everything we need. Mm -hmm. Because me researched it to death to make sure that if we broke down in the freaking desert, because that's an inhospitable place, we would be okay. Yeah. Now, what kept us from being able to rescue ourselves and get out of there very quickly? What? I'm going to call you out. You took out my magic tool bag that had the stuff I needed to repair that hose piece. Okay. And put shoes there instead. Okay. So that was an unforeseen circumstance. Never in a million world, a million years, but I think that T connection that connects one side of the engine to the other, which circulates the radiator fluid would break. Okay. But we fixed it. We used our ingenuity, but what turned out to be a minor inconvenience for us and a funny story to tell. Right. Yeah. And that overpreparedness that we were, which allows us to be able to tell a funny story now, was all brought about by the research and the effort that we put into being able to survive the situation and the environment that we were in. And see, at least... These people don't do that, and it's no one's fault but theirs. I wouldn't say that about all these cases. There's that one older guy who was researching and trying to find this, and he was fairly well prepared. And, and what it was took that, him out? 
that one slip and fall. That's not Forrest Finn's fault. You can slip and fall in the bathtub. Nope. Nope. <laughs> no. Yes. He had proper gear. That's still not his fault. That's not Forrest Finn's fault. Forrest Finn never said go up there on that little slippery ledge and slip and fall. It wasn't even a slippery ledge. And, and you know what? If the if the treasure wasn't anywhere close to where he was being, then the man interpreted the poem incorrectly and, and see, went along the wrong thing. That is the other thing. When you build a story or build a scenario using certain mechanisms like a poem or a story or like I was going back to Kit Williams masquerade, which is a children's book that kind of diminishes the danger and risk. This guy used a poem. So, which is romanticizing. Okay. First off, I don't look at poem as being romantic because I'm not that kind of guy. Well, no, no, no. And I see, understand what you're saying. The word romantic. Okay. Well, I mean, understand what you're saying, but at the same time you could look at a treasure map and, and see like, where if somebody drew mermaids on the side of it and these you know, whimsical pictures on the side of it and look at that being where it may be downplays the actual risk, right? Okay. It's all open to interpretation. You know? I. If you went out there and searching for this man's treasure, mm-hmm. using the clues that he gave you on a poem and you went out there unprepared and you died, not his fault. If you interpreted it incorrectly and went to smash a statue in in the center of Santa Fe, <laughs> right? That's not his fault. None of the actions that these people took from reading and deciphering his poem, right, mm-hmm. is his fault because it was all open to interpretation. These people interpreted one way or the other, and they were obviously incorrect. But it is his fault knowing the human need to find treasure. No, and it's to not. Find absolutely not. Something of value. Because you asked me before, would you go on this quest and look for Forrest Finn's treasure? And what did I tell you? No. Absolutely not. And you're like, why? I'm like, because it's too vague. We'd get out there in the middle of nowhere, and we could probably get, we could probably die. All the, I gave you all the reasons in the world to not do it. And all those reasons in the world are some of the reasons that killed these other people. And there are many. They people. weighed the risk and said, it's worth me going out to see if I can get it. This is not like geocaching where you go and you know look behind a dumpster like a weirdo at the back of a store and try to find some little things. You put your little initials on a piece of paper. You're going to make or, so many of our listeners I right do now. Not, I do not care. Bring it on, geocachers and letterboxers, you weirdos. They're all like one step above a LARPers. Would you stop? The live action role playing people. You realize you're insulting your wife too. <laughs> Which one are you? Letter boxer. Okay, so you're not a LARPer, right? Where you're throwing like a, a leather bag, a, you know. A satchel. <laughs> a, a nut skin goat sack thing. Like, you know, potion, you know, whatever, man. All I'm saying is, is that these people, they weighed the risk, right? Mm-hmm. They sat down and they said, okay, I'm going to be going to the San Juan Mountains or whatever. I need to be prepared. And they weren't prepared enough. They weighed the risk. They made the choice. And the result is what happens is what happened. No. Not his fault. No. If I say go to the store and get us some Oreo double stuff cookies Mm -hmm. and it's super snowy and crazy outside yeah, and you go, hmm, is the reward of the cookies worth the risk? And you go and the trailblazer flies off the road and goes into a ditch. Mm -hmm. Was that reward worth it? No, but you weighed the risk and said, I'm going to Mm. see what happens. And what happens is just like in Indiana Jones and the last crusade. Oh, he chose poorly. I would make a horrible mm, no. joke right now. About you could try. <laughs> and you know what? You can go to court and you can sue. This is the devil made me do it. So if you really think about it, a lawyer is going to go, so wait a minute, you're telling me that your greed was so great that you put your own personal safety to the side for the greed of getting millions of dollars. And these economic and they're gonna go, times, well, yeah. yes. Even before that. And you're going to go, yeah, and say, okay, well, you made a choice. You put your own personal safety aside in exchange for riches and wealth, and the results, shockingly enough, didn't go your way. So now you're mad. You're just a spoiled sport, and you're going to But no, because that also, I mean, because that same argument, that same type of reasoning could be used with, like, arguments about entrapment. If you leave something out there no, of no, value. He did not, no, 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 you cannot use this as entrapment. Yeah. Because he left enough clues and it's difficult enough to where you have to solve the puzzle and you have to do all the stuff. Entrapment is, oh, wait a minute. So you left a car with the keys in it 
and the engine running where I could just be, you know, walking by and opportunistically steal a vehicle. You still have your moral compass. And you know how they got around that, right? Like in New Mexico, yeah. they put up the signs that say bait car in areas. Just to alert that's, the that's, criminals. That sign is the same thing as his poem. If his poem down at the bottom says proceed at your own risk, as most of them do, then he's fine. Those signs are the same thing as his poem. No, well, you're not winning this. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> nope. There's no, you made the choice. If it works in your favor, yay. If it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't. At this time. Now, if that lady can prove that she solved it. Mm-hmm. Right, and if she's one hundred percent accurate, and her buddy or whatever hacked her computer and stole it, she actually has a little bit of a case. I mean, against that person that stole it, she has no case against Forrest, Forrest Finn whatsoever. At this time, I mean that the treasure is valued at almost two million now. Sure, that's what he says. I mean, yeah. Now, what happens if they find the treasure and there isn't gold and rubies and general and gems and stuff in there? It's just like un- unpublished manuscripts of uh, Woody Allen. <laughs> well, see, here is the thing. I, depending on the website you found, it was kind of weird because it was like artwork and like valuables. And I'm like, okay, am I going to find like 50 rare beanie babies? You know, I'm like. Yeah. So you, you don't really know. But at the end of the day, I still think this whole thing is fishy. Nobody has gotten anywhere close in over a decade. Now all of a sudden, magically he gets multiple lawsuits and it's been found. Yeah. He can easily say, I got nothing to do with this dude. Found it. I'm done. I'm out. Or he knows, he's- which at one point it would be. Yeah. Now, if it had been me, I'd have been like, screw you, man. You're on your own. Too bad. And hopefully I would die before I went to court. I would take it. I would take it back. Because, I mean, if I'm getting older and it's causing this much difficulty and people are just going to be so obstinate about it, I would just find treasure hunts over. Then he would get sued because you took away my chance. To win the treasure. But that goes back to my old argument. Right. And which is still wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not wrong. Here. Yes, you are. Nope. If you, yeah, now, okay, say <laughs> if you ride a roller coaster, if you want to do the whole risk versus reward thing, you ride a roller coaster and it structurally goes down or whatever, somebody's at fault for that. Mm-hmm. Because you went in there knowing that you had some idea of being safe because of the way it was put together, constructed, maintenance checks, all that sort of thing. If that was not done, then there you go. Now, this particular situation, there is no guarantee for any of that sort of thing. There's not even any expectation that you'll be safe in the quest to find the treasure at all. So if you're putting out there that, oh, well, you know, there should be, there should have been some idea of personal safety involved and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Not at all. Nope. Not how this goes. So I still think more to this is going to come out and we're going to let you know every time we hear it. I don't think, I think there's something fishy about the fact that it was found. It seems way too convenient all of a sudden. Now, it could also be, I mean, this guy's 89 years old. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, and he estimates over 350,000 people have searched for it. So, I have it 350,000 people, if three per, three of them die or four people die, that's less than like 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0001%. And don't correct me on my maths because I'm not a math magician. Is it just three? I thought it was more. Okay. Maybe it's six. Same thing. And uh, 350, that's 1,000. That's a lot. I right. think that's a bit that's high. estimated. I yeah. mean, there's probably been way more than that. He was like, oh, we've heard the Creep Geeks podcast. Let's go out and try to find it. And they got out there and like, man, this shit is hot. Quick it's hot in the desert, so I don't want to do this anymore. And they went home. Right? If we got out there and it looked like we were going to die from doing it, it was like, hmm, which one's better? Two million bucks and being dead or not being dead and come back to fight another day or search another day or whatever. Right? Okay. Yep. And know. what he says at the very end of it, when he was asked how he feels now that the treasure was found, Finn told the Santa Fe New Mexican on Sunday, I don't know. I feel halfway kind of glad and halfway kind of sad because the chase is over. Hmm. I don't know. See, I don't know why he calls it a chase. He makes it seem like, it, you know, if you don't find it quick enough, that the opportunity to grab it will be gone. And he never put it out there like that. Where, oh, you better hurry up because your limited time offer, if you don't act right now, you know, because that would be different. If he put it out there and he said, okay, for a limited time, you're going to be able to find this. And somebody died because he put this unnatural or unnecessary risk of time involved to make people get out there and hurry and needlessly, you know, 
In other words, it, 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 that would amplify the actual risk involved. He didn't. He just did a poem and said, hey, there's two million bucks worth of treasure out there. Good luck. And he got hints from some people. Some people said they gave him hints and all this other stuff. Or he gave them hints, I should say. I don't know. He's been saying, like, some people have been within 200 feet of it. That's if, that's helpful. 200 feet in the wilderness? That's... That's nothing. We've been out there looking for stupid geocaches where we've been, like, three feet, according to the... Ge- you know, oh, and we still couldn't find it. We didn't go back and yell at the... Uh, that happens in geocaching, too, where he's like, I was, according to my GPS, I was within four feet. I couldn't find it. You need to make it easier to find. And what did we do? We didn't. We didn't. We're like, no, you should do better next time. You should try harder. <laughs> you should go back and look. You know what I'm saying? This is the same thing. Yep. Sorry. I don't know. I do. I just, I, th- I think something needs to be done. I, I think there I, needs to be proof that it's been found. Well, yeah, I want to see the evidence. I want to see the treasure. I want to see the whole thing because I'm not looking at it as being, you know, you know, is he being truthful in what he said in the treasure and stuff? I think there's something fishy about this was magically found that. All of a sudden, you know, he's had multiple instances of lawsuits being filed against him. And it's already been found. They haven't been. Nobody has been close to it in a decade. And now, all of a sudden, magically, it's been found. Yeah. Something's weird. Something's fishy. And we're going to keep reporting on it when we can. But anyway, what we're going to do right now is we're going to take a, a second and play a little bit of a commercial. And you're listening to the Creep Geeks podcast. We'll be right back. Audible is audio entertainment that entertains, educates, and inspires. For you, the listeners of the Creep Geeks podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a 30-day free trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash cheap geek. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash cheap geek for your free audiobook. Enjoy this with your free trial. 30 days of membership free, plus two free audiobooks that are yours forever. One credit a month after trial, good for any book, regardless of price. Exclusive member savings, get 30% off additional audiobooks, easy exchanges, go of a book, swap it for free, anytime, seriously. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash cheap geek for your free audiobook today. And we're back. Yep. Okay, so moving back into the podcast, because Finn's treasure has been found under what we think to be fishy circumstances, let's talk about this. So, I was watching TV the other day, right? Yeah. And if you know anything about us at all, which is a weird statement, because some people will know more than others, of course, we cut the cable, you know, the coaxial cable that connects you to cable television, way back in 2008, right? Right. You remember? Yep. Okay. So recently, since we've relocated to a place that geographically doesn't have internet for us, we wound up getting satellite TV. We got satellite internet first. We wound up stealing satellite TV, basically. And I've been watching shows as they come on TV ever so often because it's been really hot. Uh, My excuses broke my neck. I've been kind of hanging out, sort of letting that sort of thing heal. Right? Yeah. And one of the things that came on TV was finding Bigfoot. (laughs) Now, we have been to events and conferences and that sort of thing where the finding Bigfoot people have been there. Well, Bobo and what's his name? Cliff. Cliff Barackman. Yeah. And we've seen these guys a couple times and, you know, talked to them a little bit. And, you know, Pepper hung out and had a conversation with Bobo and Cliff when they were sitting there talking to Kentucky Headhunter guys. It was great. (laughs) Right? (laughs) And one of the shows that came on was finding what's called the episode was actually called, and this came out in 2012. Okay. It's called Bobo marks his turf. Yeah. Okay. It was in the finding Bigfoot episode came out December 23rd, 2012 in season three. And it was about New Mexico. Yeah. Right. We used to live in New Mexico. And so I'm like, well, let me watch this in shock. Upon shock, where they were was exactly where we had our experiences. Yeah. Where we've talked about hearing baby cry and we had some rocks thrown at us and things like that. And we've we told the story a couple of times. We actually were 
kind of went into it a little bit on Ed's show uh, where we did a live stream with him. Yeah, Bigfoot Quest. Yeah, Bigfoot yeah. Quest, where we sort of talked about it in New Mexico, where we had large, and we were so stupid at the time. We, we thought people were riding around with, you know, running around through the woods and riding around on UTVs, hooping and hollering and throwing these big softball-sized rocks at us, and we were all by ourselves on purpose because we didn't want to be hanging around everybody. Yeah. We just thought it was just New Mexicans out there having a good time. Yeah. <laughs> we're like bah. and you know, so anyway we had our experiences and it's like huh and then we started to kind of look at things a little bit differently and started to realize wow okay that was a possible bigfoot experience that we had and we started looking at the paranormal stuff and realized that most places that we went to had some sort of paranormal significance and we kind of started the creep geeks thing right yeah so in this particular episode of bobo marx's turf finding bigfoot this was season three they went to the Jemez Mountains to investigate a thermal video image captured during a Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization expedition. So BFRO. Yeah. Now, these guys are supposed to be professionals, right? This isn't some dude out in the woods. These, this is a group that goes and looks for Bigfoot. <laughs> and they had testimonials of local eyewitnesses. And in this particular episode, they found out that the team discovered a particular Bigfoot may be residing in the Valley Caldera which is a national preserve that hosts vast herds of elk. <laughs> which is absolutely true. We've almost run into vast herds of elk when we went up there in a the car a couple times. Yeah. And it's like this big grassy area, like a prairie almost, in the middle of these volcanic mountains and stuff. And also, fun fact, is uh, has the cabin where Walt from Longmire lived. So if you ever seen Longmire, the show... Which is a great show, by the way. Yeah. Mainly because if you lived in New Mexico, you could recognize every place they ever filmed because, you know, that's what they did. You'd realize that, wow, that's in the Valley Caldera, which is like a stone's throw from the camping area where we used to go camp all the time. Seriously. It now, is not far. No, it's not. And when I say camping, I don't mean like a little campground. I mean, there's one spot where it's basically like 20 campsites and it's. 14 miles long and you're in the mountains where if you need any kind of supply at all, you're getting in your car and you're driving 30 miles to get back to the gas station slash store. That's on the basically reservation. Well, the, the one forest road that most people use is what? 17 miles long. Yeah. And at one end and funny, it's the end closer to Valley's Caldera. There's a tiny little fishing shop. Yeah. And you can buy, bread for seven dollars <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know <laughs> it's definitely a recreation area yeah and it's in the you know he national recreation area you got valley caldera if you keep going further down you get you know yeah. uh, los alamos <laughs> so. you also have a uh, tris conscious trailhead which is popular with climbers and that's where we found stick structures yeah yeah um so what they did was they went out and they did their episode and um bobo stayed there right yeah. To investigate on his own because uh, I think Matt Moneymaker made like a, a hoop call or whatever and he got a response. And when he was trying to listen to the response, Bobo keyed up his microphone and stepped over it and it got really, and Matt Moneymaker got really mad at Bobo. And like right after that, Bobo was like, well, I'm going to stay. And he stayed for like three days camping. Yeah. In the Jimenez Mountains. And the funny thing is, in all those shots where they were actually in the camping area, with the rock structures and the, the scenery they were using to film the shots of them talking about the expeditions and the places they went in a town hall meeting and all that stuff. Yeah. Was exactly where we camped. In fact, you can go to our Facebook page and look at our old Instagram account photos and see them. Yeah. And funny, all of it was filmed at one direction because if you filmed at another direction, you would see a dirt road and campers. Yes. <laughs> I mean, because it's the whole place is like forested canyons and stuff like that. And, of course, they believe it's the perfect habitat for the world's largest, mysterious, most apex predator, Bigfoots. And they took a hot air balloon up and, you know, look for it and all that kind of stuff and did this stuff to make the show interesting. But I thought it was super interesting that they would actually do that because we we were there. We experienced the same thing. Of course, it was a couple years later, but we had no idea. We'd never seen that show before. And here I am. You know, looking at this show going, we were there, man. We had experiences that were more exciting than the experience that brought them there in the first place. Yeah. 
And what was scary is in their town hall meeting, all those people, every one of them had their hands up. Yeah, man, totally seen all that stuff. And we actually saw one of those guys at yeah. uh, Linda and Richard Smith's thing. Yep. Yeah. So. For the U- 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 yeah. uh, New Mexico UFO paranormal forum. UFO yeah. forum thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it was kind of strange because it, okay, kind of tie this in. We met a park ranger who was there at, at one of the hot springs and he missed, had a date. Talked to him all, what, hour? He's ex-military. We chatted it up for a while. Yeah. I brought up Bigfoot. He clammed up, wouldn't say another word, and said, I would never camp where you guys camp ever. Then I started talking to him about trying to get a job with the Forest Service. and yeah, how, which, which is not related. Well, well. so he, he was mentioning that one of the easier ways in is to get a job with, like, the road crews and the transportation crews because you dig out and you clear some of the dirt roads. Yeah. That's the easiest way to get a job in, but they were currently clearing a certain newer or not newer section, but a section that hadn't been cleared in a very long time. Yeah. And this section leads off into an area that I never even knew it could lead into because right. this area is legendary with like rock hunters, whatever. Their problem was when they're trying to clear this area, some of the construction equipment was being like damaged, damaged, like deliberately damaged. Yeah. And it's a lot of effort for a camper or just a bunch of like rabble rousers to just go out all that way, especially up these dirt roads that aren't even finished just to damage this equipment. Yeah. Yeah. And we had a, another experience. Where we were going down the road and seeing a black bear weighed every bit of like 500 pounds. It was a big black bear Gosh. between three and 500 pounds to say. Come running down off a mountain, hauling butt, man. I've never seen a bear run like it was so scared. You could see its eyeballs, mouth wide open. It was running for its life. Yeah. And it ran right down across the street, right, actually ran right down across the road, like directly in front of us. I had to slam the brakes Gosh. and went through some campers' campsite. Yeah. And they were standing there like, holy crap. <laughs> and this bear was just running. Got to admire the guy. He didn't drop his beer. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, it was so quick. But what yeah. scares a bear like that to run down? And it, it and where this bear came from, there's no campsites up there. There's no hikers up there. I mean, it's like it's serious terrain to climb up. And that bear was scooting. Yeah. And we just kind of stopped and we watched it go by. And you could hear all the crashing and you know, all the noise from where it came from. But we didn't see anything, you know? Yeah. And as we started to go past these the campers that had their little site like right off the road, they just kind of looked at us and we looked at them like, what the, what the heck was all that about? Yeah. And then they had to look, you know, because they were like amazed. And we creeped by real slow and just kind of looked at them. They kept looking at us. And you could see their expressions change from fear, amusement, bewilderment to, huh, we got to be here. We were camping here. You know what I yeah. mean? So when you see a huge bear go flying through your camp, I mean, it didn't, it didn't even stop. Yeah. You start thinking to yourself, man, I hope whatever scared that is still out there. There's bear here and then we're camping. Do you I mean, do you pack up your stuff and go home or do you stay? I remember I had that, that. was the look like, yeah. man, do I pack up and go? Should I stay or should I go now? Right. Yeah. I had those little sets of photos of the, the, so out in the Southwest, your cattle are allowed to roam on certain forest lands and BLM lands. Oh yeah. And I had a couple of random sets of photos where cows would hide. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, you know, funny. Underneath the trees, you see like five or six, sometimes eight cows just all hiding up in the, and you're like, whoa. And it's kind of scary when you're yeah. walking around, you come across like a pack of cows. Yeah. I don't know if they're, is that what you call them? Cattle. No, I don't know what you call a cow. Is herd. it a herd though when there's only like five or six of them? Is it just like a pack of them? I don't, I think it's You know, like you have a murder of crows, <laughs> um, a complaint of Karens, <laughs> right? <laughs> I think it's still a herd. So. Yeah. And, you know, our first experience was, just real quick in a nutshell, the dog didn't want to lay down. The dog kept, you know, doing the <laughs> thing. While we were camping. While we were camping, kept looking out the window. was just staring out at this, like, big stump, about six-foot stump. It's like three and a half to four feet wide, burn-up-looking, pointy-headed stump. How far was it? Uh, about 20 yards. So you figure between, just to say between 40 and 60 feet. Yeah where the other burnout trees were, because where we were camping, there was a forest fire that happened there. You know, actually, it wasn't really forest, but more of a brush fire, but it burned up trees and stuff like that. Yeah. 
And, you know, kept trying to tell Ben to lay down and I kept staring, staring at it, looking at him like, it's just a stump and lay down, you know, because sometimes dogs misidentify things, right? Mm-hmm. Next morning, woke up, looked out the window because I couldn't sleep all night long and the stump was gone. Yeah. So, hmm. a little cone-headed Bigfoot. It seemed like he was just as wide as he was tall, could have been standing there because Ben was having no part of it. But he wasn't angry enough or scared enough to do full on dog barks like when the pizza guy or the wind blows. He was doing it little like I see it. I want to let it know I see it. I know it. it. I don't want it to come over here. I don't want to be a part of it. Yeah. Doing that thing where they fill up their face with air. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like we're like, what is that? Because I mean, I don't know. And it Remember that? We left. You know, I want to get up at like 4.30 in the morning. I'm like, oh, I'm going to make some coffee, and we're going to drive 100 miles away to go camp somewhere yeah. else. And we did. And remember, we were walking around that morning, because we kind of got there a little late at night, and you were making coffee, and you were already trying to put the tables away, and I'm taking the dogs to try to get them to go potty. They don't want to go potty. Yeah, I poured oatmeal in a disposable cup. I'm like, yeah. here's your breakfast. You can eat this on the way. We're out. And so. I found two different completely discharged and then damaged pellet guns. I yeah. found, like, all sorts of stuff. I was just like. And see, and that's kind of what we, you know, led us to think that, okay, people come out here and they have a good time and they make a mess and ride around, yell and scream and fish and drink and all that sort of thing. Yeah. And so eventually we went to camp in there again, and we had, like, People running through the woods and throwing big rocks at us and stuff like we weren't supposed to be there. Because it was a prime camping spot in our camping van. And then later on, as we were leaving, you know, seeing a ranger guy cruising by. And was like, yeah, people are getting kind of loud out there, man. And he was like, you know, you you guys are like the only ones here. <laughs> nobody camp, nobody goes down this far and camps. Yeah. Because everybody camps further in, so I, you know, I'm going on this way anyway. I was going to see what you, because I seen you guys last night. So we were there kind of pretty much by ourselves because we were very much at the end of like the 12 mile line or mark roughly of where we can go camping in a place that has over 14 miles of campsites. So, yeah, I don't know. And, you know, people have heard screaming out there too. And now an elk will make a crazy sound when they're like rutting and mating and doing all that stuff. But, you know, when you hear screams and you hear baby cries and you hear unusual things like that, the place is kind of sketchy. And you can ask the natives that live there. And they'll tell you about all that stuff, you know. Yeah. So, anyway, we watched that episode, season three, from December 2012, called Bobo Marx's Turf. And if you ever want to see the Jemez Mountains and where they went and did the research and all that stuff in Valley Caldera, you should check it out. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you can actually still see it on the website. So, like the full episode, but okay. we camped there multiple times, many, many times. We went to Jemez almost every weekend for a long time, and that's where we had our experiences. Cool. So, yeah, kind of neat. So, anyway, moving back into the podcast, thought you might like it. think that was, uh, we, anyway, I thought it was kind of interesting, so. Yeah. You know, so that led, kind of led me to looking into other things, and there was a, a couple other instances of Bigfoot sightings since the Jemez Jemez Mountains and the Jemez, Jemez, however you want to pronounce it, National Recreation Area is there, right? Let me look into other things and come to find out Four Corners. Yeah. Where you have like Utah, Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, all those states come together and in their corner, it becomes the Four Corners area. And I found an article that basically said Bigfoot, hab- Bigfoot habituation slash close encounter near Shiprock, New Mexico. Okay. Which is in the crypto corners. Yeah. Which is the basically four corners, right? I mean, and, th- but crypto four corners, actually, I think that particular group or labeling goes all the way into almost um, Cabizon. Yeah. Technically. And, and, yeah. Yeah. It covers, covers some area there. Yeah. And this report talks about JC Johnson and the crypto four corners. And then basically they had done some stuff. They'd been looking for, um, you know, trying to find evidence. They found like Sasquatch hair tissue samples and stuff like that for a new DNA study. Right. Yeah. And the anthropology department at the university of New Mexico had some participants that agreed to submit the material that they'd found. Right. To see kind of what's up with it. And they were involved in what was called a catch study where they were kind of looking into this whole thing. And I don't want to go into it in great and agonizing detail too much. Yeah. But what they said was, is that in the location near the San Juan River in the vicinity of Shiprock, New Mexico, on the Diné um, Navajo mm-hmm. Reservation, yeah. right? Then they had 
an adult and two juvenile Bigfoots go walking towards the mesa behind her house. This guy named George, George Harvey, has his homestead there. And he had seen these Bigfoots, an adult and two juvenile Bigfoots, walking towards the mesa behind their home. Right? And so one of the doctors who was doing the research study, Dr. Christopher, noted that the face of the mesa is about a 45-degree angle. And, you know, it doesn't sound like a lot until you're walking it, but when you walk 45-degree angle up a mesa, that's pretty serious business, man. And these things had no problem easily going up to one side, right, getting to the top and then disappearing. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, that happened in, like, 2015. That was a sort of a daylight thing in the encounter and allegedly, there's a video of this. They have an encounter video that happened January 11th in 2015. Oh, we shared that. Yeah. Yeah. And George's sister basically um, talked about that there was, you know, that these animals were probably part of a larger habituation or habit, habituation. How do you say that? Habituation. You were right. Yeah, a group mm-hmm. that migrates through the area. And she was on a four-wheeler on their homestead, and she had her dogs when she encountered several huge figures hiding behind a cropping of trees. There's not a lot of trees out there, man. So you would notice if there's a lot, like, yeah. like we talked about with the cows, right? The cows hide up underneath the trees. They get shade and that sort of thing, and they'll all cluster up underneath the trees. So I'm sure when she went cruising up to them, she probably thought that's what they were. Yeah. And she said it was at that point that three Bigfoot stepped out, which scared her, stunned her, because she'd never seen anything like that, right? And that her brothers and uh, her brothers had basically told her, mentioned that they exist, but she never believed the accounts, but she had ran into them, so she's seen them, right? And so she told J.C. Johnson and the others in the group that, you know, during the eight-year period that they had many account, uh, many sort of accounts and encounters with the Harry boys. We might know people that know them because we do. my friends call them that, too. Yeah, they're not really called Sasquatch. I mean, we give them names like Bigfoot and Sasquatch. I mean, they have all sorts of names like Wild Men, Hairy Men, um, Hairy Boys, Wood Boogers, all that kind of crazy stuff. So when you see it in the lore, you know, you don't really see it as like Bigfoot or Sasquatch. You know what I'm yeah. saying? You see them as being, you know, all sorts of stuff. The furry ones, you know? Yeah. So the names are calling them Hairy Boys the older, or Hairy Men. And the older Native people call them the Hairy Old Man. Yeah. Yeah. Or Hairy Brother. Or the old ones. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, she said that there was a a 10-foot Bigfoot, similar in description as Rufus. Rufus was one that stood about 12 feet tall, covered in dark brown hair. So they gave these things names. So they would seen them enough to give them names. The youngest member of the group stood about 8 feet tall, had reddish-colored hair, and she described each of their faces as mostly hairless with dark skin, flat, narrow narrow noses, wide foreheads. And she also stated that Rufus had large, bulbous eyes that may have been three inches in diameter. That's pretty big. Yeah. And a lot of them don't really refer to him as having narrow noses. You know, So it seems like when you hear some of these descriptions of hairy men or Bigfoot or Sasquatch or whatever, depending on where they are, they can they have differing facial features, you know? So it's like they have their own sort of genetic thing going on, right? That's okay. So now I'm like amused on a like an anthropological level because out here everybody talks about the the flat round nose. Yeah, flat, nose. sort of wide nose, you know, sort of primate looking. And if this thing has like a skinny, narrow nose and wide foreheads and that sort of thing. So if there are genetic differences in description, maybe due to location or traveling or whatever. And, you know, because they, they, they do mention that there's probably not enough Sasquatch or Bigfoot to you know, support, you know, reproduction and stuff like that. So it, it wouldn't be that many. But what if there's like way more than we know? And these things travel, right? Because a lot of them do migrate, according to the reports that you hear. And, like, even they, you know, Alex was saying, as she was interviewed by Dr. Christopher, you know, basically that she thinks that they migrate because of the experiences and encounters they've had in the past. If you're just traveling through, following the weather, and you have these Bigfoots coming in, they travel and they migrate and they go back and forth, maybe in such long distances, who's to say they don't run into other Bigfoots and kind of, like, you know, have um, mate time? So a little... This- little uh, well, okay, so this particular area is, gosh, it looks like it's only 15 miles away from El Moro, 15 right. miles west. And then from there, probably another 15 miles north. So we're getting right in the territory of the CDT, so the Continental Divide Trail, yep. which only X amount of people are allowed to do. And there's the other trail out there that 
people really try to avoid having humans go to. Yeah, well, there's a lot of that area where nobody goes because it's it's completely inhospitable. Like in order to be able to get out there, you'd have to walk, and nobody wants to walk you know hundred miles in the desert. Yeah, through so, rough terrain. I mean, so you could effectively live out there, and nobody would see you. You know, if you heard a plane flying by, you just hide under a rock. Ooh. Nobody would ever know you're out there. It's only like ten miles from Fence Lake. Yeah. Which has the UFO and Bigfoot stuff. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, she, when she's when Alex is talking about her encounter, she says she sat in the four-wheeler, paralyzed from the shock of the encounter that she had, where she's seen him underneath the tree. Yeah. And she knows that the 10-foot Bigfoot made a whistling sound. And her dog, Zora, Alex's dog, Zora, approached and laid down near the youngest member of the Bigfoot trio. And then the Bigfoot remarkably reached down and rubbed Zora's ear. As it turns out, these Bigfoot had previously brought bones of kills to Zora while tied up on the homestead property at night. And the young Bigfoot has also been known to draw on rocks. Oh. Yeah. And so from the information that you know we received from JC, and this is on Phantoms and Monsters, by the way, there are several Bigfoot clans in the general area. And another known group includes an older female who has been seen with several juveniles over the years. At one point, she had three sons traveling with her. And it seems that these hominids are not monogamous and that the female in particular had bred with several males in a wide migration area. And it says, at present time, photographic evidence is being suppressed. There is much more research required on the various clans within the habituation area. It's also tribal land and with all respect to the privacy and customs of its residents must be maintained. I, that sentence, though, makes me mad. The photographic evidence is being suppressed. Yeah. And just for a fun fact, in the picture of Alex being interviewed by Dr. Christopher, he has a camera. <laughs> yeah. And even a more fun fact is it's a Canon camera. But anyway. So you hear about Bigfoot not liking dogs, like especially on the East Coast. On the East Coast, it's different. It's weird. You hear about, you know, Bigfoot's not liking dogs and they, you know, eating dogs and fighting dogs and it's all the crazy stuff. But when you hear about them in the Southwest, it's kind of a different story. Yeah. You know, and you hear about them when, the, um, when they get on native lands and stuff like that, these animals, if they even exist at all, act differently than they do somewhere else. Like the skunk ape is not supposed to be one of these like nice, nice friendly Bigfoots at all. More of an animal. So it kind of makes you wonder if there are clans of these things traveling around, right? Yeah. Maybe there's different genetic types. Like the skunk, skunk ape has like three fingers versus five. You know, what if there's just a different sort of species and subsets? And some of these can be so primitive looking that they could almost look like werewolves or the dog men, you know? And we, we get those those theories from like Matt Delph and from even Asheville Cryptid Society. They have theories similar to those. Yeah. Where it's different species. But My thought is, what if it's not different species? What if it's that their breeding population is kind of slight and some of these subspecies that we see are actually just deformities? Mm. You wouldn't know. And there's also, you know, the theory that, hey, the government knows about this kind of thing and that they have like these special groups to go out and sort of police and take care of things when these things act up and get all crazy, like up around Boone, North Carolina. And we actually talked about that, right? That encounter with a person that we met recently when we went out on a little adventure and the person that we talked about knew about that because they were a moderator from the website where I read it from, where they reported that event. Yeah. And I'm not going to say who it is, John Johnson, but remember <laughs> if we talked about it, you know, it's like, Oh wow. But see, so it kind of makes you wonder, man. Okay. So if I were to use an animal as an example though, I also think it's, it's kind of, it's situational and environmental because when we were in New Mexico and we went down towards Fort Stanton to go camping, we had that friendly little, friendly large elk just walk up to the van and stick its head in the van. Yeah. At like 11 o'clock at night, 1130 at night. Yeah, it was very late, very foggy, and this huge elk just stuck his head. We were looking, we were trying to get directions. Was it a she? I think it was a she. Uh, well, it, yeah. it didn't have, it had, I don't know, they, they weren't like huge antlers, but it had like little, little yeah. nubby sticking up. Um, very tall though. Yeah. Cause we were in a place. Okay. If you ever do any traveling off road anywhere yeah. or in areas where you may not have cell phone service, a GPS for your car, old school GPS still works. But so, and that's what we were doing. We had plugged it in. We were trying to get 
the geographic location where we wanted to be, we were actually at Fort Stanton. So we had that that elk who was not scared, no. not intimidated, just stick its head in the van. Very large creature, right? Looking for a snack. And just stuck its head in the van. Not it wasn't a threatening situation. Could have gone bad, but it didn't. But then out here we went to Wouldn't let me pet it though. <laughs> we went uh, to the Smoky Mountains National Park and we got within distance of an elk and it kind of got aggressive. Yeah, no, it got very aggressive. Of course, it was that time of year. So is there just that disparity between regions and animals in general? If Bigfoot is an animal, I mean, I don't know. See that, that elk in the Smoky Mountains could have beat me up, you know? Oh uh, so, yeah. Yeah. It just makes me wonder because a lot of people think that Bigfoot are super friendly, right? Yeah. And the natives talk about if you just leave them alone, you'll be fine. Yeah. You know, and they also talk about back in the olden days, they would actually speak and communicate with each other and that the Bigfoots actually use the ancient tongue or the old. The old know, language. Old language, like Anastasia or whatever it's called. I don't, I'm not really for sure. And that sort of thing. And then when you get further and further towards the East Coast, it's not. It's a little bit different. They're more aggressive. They're more violent. They're more, you know. So I don't really know. I think that the, if if you hear all these stories about Bigfoot and you do a lot of research in Bigfoot and Sasquatch and Hairy Men and all that sort of thing, it seems that a lot of the geographic location has, you know, different sort of characteristics to determine what kind of encounter you may or may not have. Yeah. So who knows? I mean, you know, you hear in the Pacific Northwest where camps are being attacked and loggers being ripped apart and hunters and all that sort of thing. Like they're almost more territorial than you hear as they're, you know, in some native areas where they, I guess, maybe possibly feel safer. They're more friendly and less likely to give you problems like scratching a dog's ear and bringing the dog's bones, which is brilliant, by the way. Yeah. You take the res dog who's tied up protecting the homestead who's supposed to bark at all this stuff, but you keep bringing it steaks and treats. <laughs> it's going to say, yeah, man, come on in. How you doing? You know, dog's going to do the old tail wagon thing instead of barking, sending the alarm, right? Yeah. But see, okay, so I, and again, not to speak on behalf of different indigenous people and different native groups, but like the Navajo, it seems to be a more tolerable relationship. Yeah. And then if we go like with my friend Sam and her Lakota people, you know, it's more of that that slightly trickster fay type situation yeah. where it's a mutual respect. You don't pee it off, but it it may do something. So it 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 really does seem to be regional. You know, yeah, it can be. I mean, it's it's just it's kind of a weird thing. So. You know, and so I thought that story was kind of neat. But then you when you look at the other story that we were going to talk about here in about two seconds about the, what happened to the Zuni Pueblo, Zuni or Zuni Pueblo, mm-hmm. like this. Bigfoot stalks a forest ranger after being shot near Zuni Pueblo in New Mexico. That's oh, this sorry. was a story. So this was the area I was saying is really close to um, El Moro. So yeah. I'm sorry. Well, I mean they're all yeah. relatively close as a crow flies, but yeah. Um, this story also came off Phantoms and Monsters, where it talks about this uh, a native forest ranger shoots at a Bigfoot while with his family, and the Bigfoot stalked him continuously afterwards. Right. Hmm. So it goes where my dad and his family or my dad and his parents were on their way from Gallup, New Mexico to see a movie. So they were going to Gallup from the Zuni Pueblo or Zuni Pueblo, right? It's about 32 miles. And he says, my grandpa was a forest ranger at the time and he worked in the Zuni mountains and he was using his ranger truck to get to town because that's kind of what they did, you know? Yeah. And it's like, he's the only person that's ever explained this to me. And it's from his dad's perspective. Uh, My grandma is eerily bothered, so she doesn't much like talking about it. So anyways, they're about halfway to town, a stark out. They have these large ponderosa trees that cover both sides of the road. And it says, in the midst of driving, my grandpa stomped on his brakes, and grandma is sitting in the passenger seat, and his dad was in the back seat. And the kid's saying that basically his dad was confused at the time, right, because he's facing towards the back window on the passenger side. So it's probably a small, not like a king cab, you know what I mean? But he sees his dad quickly reach over the back seat, grab his rifle off the gun rack, he heard him open his door, and he fired one shot. My grandpa hit it, and it screamed. So his dad looks over the seat to see it running to the right of the road, which is east, takes one large step over cattle guard, and disappears into the woods. And they drove away and proceeded to watch the movie without discussing anything about what had happened. 
This is now my dad says, according to grandma and grandpa, that the Bigfoot was hairy, but not like you would expect. Its hair was fringed and balding. They said it had pale blue skin and it looked fatigued. When my grandpa shot it, it dropped its jaw for a couple seconds and its jaw dropping looked grotesque like it couldn't have possibly made its mouth any wider and then came the scream. <clears throat> the scream is the eeriest part. They also did never forget it. It was a loud, gross, and had meaning scream. And after it, after screaming, it lunged to its left and then took a step over the cattle guard and ran into the forest. The jaw dropping is what makes my grandpa not talk about it. Or what makes my grandma not talk about it. She says it's the scariest, most ugliest thing she's ever seen. All right. It says, now after they got home, it started haunting and following my grandpa. The night that my grandpa shot it, he got no sleep, but my grandma didn't sleep either, and that's how she knows. She pretended to be asleep, but both of them heard things around their house that night. Movement, noise against the walls, and an overwhelming feel- feeling like something is out there in the dark. So my grandpa continued his work as a ranger, but soon quit due to the constant run-in with this thing. When he was out in the forest, he knew it was watching. He could smell it, hear it screams, hear knocking. It made disturbances in the road just for him. It would toss branches in the road, right? And it basically, it's like it knew it does, knew his schedule and where he had to be. It scared his grandpa so much that he hasn't gone back since. And since then, it hasn't bothered him. And all this was happening while my grandpa experienced one wild night as a ranger. And he says, I believe he's seen UFOs, strange murders, very odd occurrences in that forest, like people acting too jolly, rituals, lost people. And he's written it all down. Everything has happened. It's in a binder at his house, but I really want to read it. My dad says it's nuts, but my gramps now has cancer and it's a shut-in from it. So hopefully I'll get to see him um, or get my hands on that book. And Zunai, or Zuni, is truly a place of mysteries and weird stuff goes down there, goes down there all the time. I am Maybe Grandpa thought he was shooting a skinwalker. The pale blue skin and the the receding hair just bells went off right so i'm sitting here you mean like orangutans or something almost but like the the receding with the fringe that just it's setting me off and it's bugging me i'm trying to figure out where this is yeah and the fact that the area he's describing we actually went out here not just for el moro but you and i were trying to find a fluorite mine yep and it's also where we came across other high strangeness because this is near Rama and Candy Kitchen. Yep. Which has its own set of unique people. Yep. And our <laughs> friends were like, why did you go there? That's where skinwalkers are. And murder people. And murder town. <laughs> and murder people. And fun fact, getting out of the area where we were, we got lost and wound up in a 4th of July parade. Yeah. Oh, and. In our big white van. They just like made us. I don't know what they were thinking. Because we were just trying to turn to the right to get out of town. Mm -hmm. But we pulled up and they moved the barrier out of the way and they made us turn left and they put us in the parade. Yeah. As we went through in our Great White Buffalo, our DIY adventure camper mobile, waving to the people. And my dog Ben barking the entire time at everyone. (laughs) And the people's looks on their faces as they waved very happily to see us. And then they were trying to figure out why we were there because we weren't fire. We weren't rescue. We weren't an ambulance. We weren't a classic car. We weren't a classic car. We were just basically random tourists cruising through their town. (laughs) We didn't even have a magnet that said creep geeks yet on the side of our van. We were just photographers taking pictures. Yeah. But I'm thinking about the other time when we were um, going through this area towards Rama uh, and we followed. Oh, wow. Okay. So we followed 53 West trying to find this area with petrified wood and fluorite. And one moment we were on a private mine. And then the next moment we had signs all around us saying Zuni reservation. Yeah. So we had to turn right around. Yep. So this is an area where you can get lost. The, the Ponderosa trees are what I remember because this is near the ice cave. Yeah. Yeah. So, but blue skin, the area, it's just making me think of something else, like goblin. Well, we'll figure it out later. Yeah. So, <clears throat> But it's just kind of a weird thing. And so when I seen this stuff and sort of relate, this is why I put this in here, because we relate to all of this stuff, because we've been to all of this stuff, and we've experienced slightly some of the stuff that these stories have told us. Yeah. Yeah, from other people. Some of which we may know, 
some of which we don't know, but we've heard it from the locals that were there too. And they're like, why are you there? Especially the skinwalker thing. Why are you there? You're not sure. So before we wrap up the podcast, we got one more thing to talk about. We'll talk about it real quick. Cause we've been going for about an hour and 20 minutes now. That's what we do. And it's kind of a cautionary tale, kind of a weird thing, right? Yeah. And this is like something that the only reference I really remember seeing about Papa Legba, aside from watching the American Horror Story thing, was is that you shouldn't mess around with Papa Legba. No, you should never. And we probably shouldn't even be talking about Papa Legba. <laughs> <clears throat> Honestly. Well, you, you can. I think that's part well, of Well, we the, can because we're not Haitian. This, and we've never opened up the door to speak to any Haitian slash Louisiana voodoo or any voodoo type of spirits whatsoever. Yeah. So. the. I also think that's part of the stigma to help keep the whole traditions mysterious and stuff like that. Well, maybe. Yeah. But this, I guess, comes from freak lore. Yeah. yeah. But it's Virginia. Yeah. Somewhere we've also lived, and we kind of thought we'd put it in there because it's like we talked about New Mexico because we've experienced there. But and this is the Virginia one popped up out of nowhere. It's kind of related. Virginia teen dies two days later after posting on social media about Papa Legba. Yeah. Uh, one Virginia teenager decided to dabble into the dark arts by practicing Haitian voodoo spells. It seems to have been a fatal mistake as she unfortunately lost her life. Known as Papa Legba, this deity of sorts is worshipped or prayed to in mystical, mystical dark art world of voodoo. Yeah. And I don't like saying that. I like saying the gray. The gray world. Well, yeah, I mean, if you look at magic as not necessarily being good or bad, but sort of in the middle there, and it is what you make of it, Papa Legba can be a good thing, can be a bad thing. Yeah, and legend says Legba will give permission to speak with the spirits of the guinea. Right. In Haitian culture, he is known as the great executioner or elocutioner. Right. And I prefer that second statement. Yeah, elocutioner is better. Yeah, because basically he can speak in any language and persuade people at will. So he stands at a spiritual crossroads at sorts. So if you go to consult him, he can build arguments that determine fate. That's how I like to look at him. Yeah, And uh, he's considered a loa, which are um, spirits of ancient Haitian and Louisiana voodoo. Um, loa is actually used to describe these lower deities and spirits in many different traditions, uh, including West African and Caribbean voodoo. Yeah, um, like voodoo gods. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Though he's most commonly known in Haiti as Papa Legba. Right. Now, allegedly, this 19-year-old Virginia resident was found dead. She was discovered in a bathtub at her mother's home, according to social media posts. Her friends found her and were shocked to find her deceased. It was a disturbing scene to see. What makes this weird is the fact that she claimed to have seen Papa Legba several days earlier. People thought nothing of it at first. Uh, She was warned by some not to try to summon use these summoning spells. Uh, he was, she was in a social media group found on Twitter who practiced spells such as witchcraft. After which she decided to start practicing voodoo spells and became obsessed with it. Caitlin snapped back to others by posting that there is nothing wrong with trying something new. And you know what? There is evidently because these people in that group were trying to say, you don't do this. You can't just like randomly just go start talking. Right. Yeah. So they're trying to warn her, and she basically said, let people live and have their own religion, right? If someone is into something different, accept that. Stop saying, no, you come from God. I'm Wiccan, and I always believe, so basically shut the F up and let me be. Hmm. Now, that kind of attitude right there, almost to me, would seem to be a little attitude, maybe a little air of disrespect. Yeah. And possibly, not necessarily disrespect to whatever she's trying to do, but maybe not taking... This whole thing is seriously as she should have. And one of the things about Papa Legba is, is that you, if you don't give him the respect or if he feels like he's being slighted, with my disclaimer, if he exists at all, things will not go good for you. You don't, you know, you, you don't, it's okay for him to fool you, but you can't fool him. Or disrespect him. Right, because you will pay the price. And this kind of speaks to that greater. That's with all of them. There's a greater debate out there. Um, I do want to acknowledge uh, Tobias Whalen from Singular 14 Society for this, where he discussed how this this umbrella tradition that is Wicca, when it starts to pull in these different pantheons of gods and different practices, like spells and stuff like that, you're pulling in stuff from a culture and a religion without being immersed in it and understanding the gravity of it. Right. So you, you basically you don't know what you're doing since you haven't been trained in it. So you should probably leave it alone. And I think some of that, that 
failure to acknowledge the tradition and culture that happens, the almost, almost, I hate to say it, like whitewashing or just commonly accepting things is causing problems. Yeah. I don't <clears throat> want to say that's why this person passed away, but I think a little more respect is needed when you approach grayer magic. Yeah, because it's down at the bottom, somebody said, uh, notably, someone from Facebook posted that they did a reading on her, and it wasn't Papa Legba that she had been that she had seen, but another Haitian voodoo spirit named Baron, who is the master of the dead. So, if you don't do it right, and you call what you think is one spirit, but you get another spirit, then basically the rules that apply to one spirit don't apply to the other necessarily. Yeah, and maybe that's what caused it. Or her demise. Nobody really knows. It just seemed to be a weird thing. And the fact that she posted the way she did, I don't know. I mean, it's terrible because she leaves behind her daughter and all that, but I, it's kind of like a Ouija board, right? You yeah. use a Ouija board to communicate and you're trying to talk to your mom or your dad or whoever, whatever family member you want. And you may not get who you think you're speaking to, right? And that's why you're supposed to close off the session and do all the things you're supposed to do to protect and, 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 basically do all that sort of thing. And if you don't, bad things can happen. And that's something I want to ask someone with more understanding, more experience, you know, somebody like, I don't know, Michelle Bellinger or somebody similar. Yeah. You know, how, when you reach out to these different energies and forces, how do you confirm your speaking with somebody genuine? Or how do you end it to make sure it's ended? Mm, true. Cause she, she, her cause of death is drowning. She drowned in the bathtub. Hmm. Yeah, and they say, you know, things that they say about her is that she was always the bright spirit of any gathering, and her resilience kept her going in challenging times, inspired by many, and basically inspired, and that she inspired basically many of her family and friends. It's a bizarre death, and they're all like, how did this happen kind of a thing. So, I don't know. Maybe it's coincidental. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's a cautionary tale. Don't know. But I'm still firmly in the camp of if you don't know 100% what you're doing, and you don't have people there to help you that maybe know more than you, and you don't have sort of a team, probably shouldn't be doing it. I don't know. Kind of a sad thing. So Okay. Yep. I think that's about all we're going to talk about today. Do you have anything that you'd like to speak about? Mm. Anything we need to kind of wrap up? Uh, Not really, other than we do have coffee back in the Creep Geek shop, as well as a couple more um, stickers and stuff like that. I will be listing our new ghost hunting bracelets soon. Ooh, yeah. Yes. Because we do have stuff like that. The coffee is actually pretty good. I will say that, and I can say that with all honesty. Everybody that's tried it has liked it. It's not bad. You should give it a shot. It's Bigfoot inspired. It's super tasty. But yeah. If you'd like to get a hold of us, you can. If you want to join our Facebook group and talk to us, you can certainly do that as well. If you search for Creep Geeks, you'll find us. We share all sorts of funny things, not necessarily just all paranormal, but just funny things in general. It's a lighthearted thing. And we enjoy the talking and the communication stuff like that. We do occasional live streams as well. When we have the opportunity to drive into town and set everything up, we do our van cast where we talk to our peeps. And you're certainly invited to that anytime you want because it's, uh, you know, kind of a nice thing. And if you're having problems, we do have uh, a phone number that you can call. It's an Indian phone number. (laughs) What? So it's in India. (laughs) Because, you know, because of this whole quarantine life we've all been experiencing, there's been a phone number set aside, right? And it's the basically first paranormal helpline in India. It gets over 10 calls daily. <laughs> and that helpline number is 999-518-600. And it's started by the paranormal company. So you can call and get some paranormal helpline tech support in India. 999-518-600. Yep. What? So you're probably going to have to use country code 011 to get out of the U.S. when you call. It is an international call. And the person who runs it named Jay basically gets 8 to 10 calls a day on average, which about 90% of those cases are similar to the ones that he talks about. Right? So if you're having paranormal issues and you need some assistance, you can call basically the helpline. So it's like paranormal tech support. I will say, I take this guy seriously. That's a pretty impressive biopic yep. right there. Yeah. From the Paranormal Company. Provides free assistance to spread awareness against blind faith, superstitions, black magic, witchcraft, and overall paranormal awareness of the following people. Those people are people who have claimed to uh, encounter a ghost or other paranormal incidents. People have doubts or curiosity about how to know about ghosts, spirits, black magic, or anything else related to the paranormal world. People that feel their house, villa, or flats are haunted. Or haunted. 
and encountering uh, unusual incidents and phenomena. So Jay Alani says the main motive behind his helpline numbers provide scientific solutions to those who are encountering any unusual incidents and have a question. So yeah, maybe they'll create a helpline number here. And he's also a renowned paranormal investigator. He actually has a book published and he's coming out with, he's got a mini series. Yep. Wow. So if it was me and I was doing some research and had questions, I would probably call a paranormal helpline, get some paranormal tech support, if you will. And with that, we're going to go ahead and end the podcast. So there you go. Yep. So that number one more time is 999-5186-00. You're calling the paranormal company. Or, you know, you could call us at 575-208-4025. Yes. And leave a message. That's right. (laughs) So anyway, we're going to roll. So see you later. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Bye.